So thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar and question and answer session for prospective chiefs. We hope all of you are gonna step up and serve as a chief this November. And we wanna go over some information to help you understand what's involved with being a chief and what we're gonna to do to prepare you to be a chief so that you can say yes when we ask. So first off, I wanna make sure you're aware uh, of some current office uh, staffing. First off, our electoral board uh, is composed of three members. We have a new chairman as of this year, and that is Ambassador Christopher Hensel. We also have the Vice Chairman, Bettina Lawton, and the Secretary of the Electoral Board, Catherine Hanley. We have a new Registrar, General Registrar as of earlier this year, Eric Spicer. You may know him because he served as our Election Manager for four years previous to that. And we have a new Deputy Registrar, Cheryl Jones, who was previously the Assistant Registrar for Absentee Mail Voting. I'm also be glad to be joined by some of our uh, office staff today. Uh, my name is Ravi, I serve as the Election Officer Manager. We have Abigail Peters, who is our election officer specialist for chiefs and assistant chiefs. And she's the person who not only assigns everyone as a chief and assistant chief, but supports and helps prepare them for election day. And we have one of our election officer staff members, the one with us today as well. So let's go over a little bit about what is the difference between a regular officer and a chief and assistant chief. Regular officers are there to process routine voters. You may have anywhere from five to 15 regular officers in a precinct, and their job is to help the voters who come in, they check in, they present their ID, you get them a ballot, and they mark and scan that ballot. It's pretty straightforward. But as a chief or assistant chief, your job would be to process non-routine voters, so individuals who couldn't be checked in immediately for whatever reason, as well as to manage the polling place operation. So just to make sure things are going smoothly, coordinating with the building staff, managing our election officers, rotating them, giving breaks, things like that. And it's just, as I said, supervising the overall precinct operations, managing rotating staff, assisting non-routine voters, and working with authorized representatives of parties or candidates who may be in the polling place. If you do agree to be a chief, what's required of you before election day? Well, you'll have to complete some required training, You'll watch a chief's briefing, which is a session that goes over some new laws and procedures about a week before the election. We'll ask you to come to our office or to another location to pick up some required supplies. You'll have to contact your election officers in your polling place, and you'll be asked to set up your polling place the day before the election. These are all things that you've either done, perhaps in the past as a regular officer, or that you've seen your chief do. And on election night, what we ask of chiefs is to drive supplies back to one of our four return locations that we'll have this November. So why are we doing this webinar and why are we asking you all to be a chief this November? Well, according to the Code of Virginia and electoral board policy, all chiefs should represent the party of the sitting governor of Virginia. As you know, there was a change in party of the governor last year. So that means as of this year, we need a Republican officer serving as the chief in all 264 precincts that we have here in Fairfax County. Now, that's going to be a big challenge because that means the individuals who serve as a chief last year aren't eligible to serve as a chief this year. So we need as many of you as possible to step up and agree to be a chief. It's a wonderful position. It's one uh, I think you'll have a lot of uh, fun doing, but we just really do need everyone uh, who can and is willing to do so to agree to be a chief. Fortunately, in every precinct, the assistant chief is going to be a Democratic officer who has been a past chief is often very highly experienced. They may have been the chief for many years there, and they'll be there to help support and in effect train you um, as you go through some of these procedures possibly for the first time. Now, of course, we understand that most of you that might be joining us today, or at least many of you have been an assistant chief before. You've done a lot of these responsibilities and you know yourself what's involved. And if that's the case, fantastic. But for those of you who may have only served, let's say as an officer one time before, that's okay. You can still be a chief but well, you'll have other people there to help support you as well. So what will we do to help train you? Well, we're gonna offer lots of online and in-person training classes this year, more than ever, to help prepare everyone. We have our new chief class, and you can see the version that's already online at any time. And that class goes over everything you need to know before the first time you serve as a chief. As I mentioned, we have our chief's briefing. This is something that's required by law that we do about a week before election day, where we brief you on new laws and procedures. So you'll take your new chief class at whatever time is convenient to you, and then you'll take the chief's briefing closer to the election. We've also got equipment open houses where we offer an opportunity for any officer, but including chiefs and assistant chiefs, 
the opportunity to come in, practice on the equipment, see what it's like to not only use the equipment, but see the opening and closing procedures. So if you agree to be a chief this year, you might come into one of those open houses and look at that equipment with a new eye as to how you would now manage that operation as opposed to being an individual assigned to one of the pieces of equipment to set up and configure. One of the new things we'll also do this year is offer many workshops to allow you to come in and practice different election day procedures and especially completing the required forms. We know that's a point of concern and stress sometimes, and we don't want it to be. We want you to feel very comfortable and very prepared for everything you're, need to, you're going to need to do on election day. Our training website is a, is a wonderful resource with lots and lots of materials that will help you out as you prepare and hopefully agree to be a chief. So if you haven't already been there, make sure to visit training.electionofficers.com and take a look around. We haven't yet updated all the materials for the November election, but you can still see everything we had for the June election, including all of our online training classes. We have our chief's notebook. We have many election guides, which are the color handouts, sample filled in forms, and other materials from past elections. So let's go over what some of those look like. First, the chief's notebook that we issue to every chief and assistant chief is currently available online for the previous election. It was significantly updated last year and even more so earlier this year. And it goes over everything you need to know before and on election day. It's a detailed manual of everything from start to end. And if you read through that manual, you'll feel very comfortable and understand everything you need to know to be a first time chief. One of the new things that we prepared this year is we updated all of our color handouts that show you how to set up and use different equipment and other procedures on election day. So for those of you who didn't serve this past June, this may be new to you. So for example, we now have these new updated guides with large detailed pictures, simple, clear instructions that go through different types of equipment and procedures. On the left, you can see a handout that goes over how to open and set up the DS200 scanner. And on the right, you can see a handout that we created for signs and posters. And it now has pictures to show you which signs go where and which posters go where. These are things that as the chief, you would hand out to your officers and give to them to say, here you go. You're responsible for opening and setting up the DS200 and here are the step-by-step -step instructions. Or your job's to go and get all the required signs and posters posted inside and outside. And here you go. Here's the guide that allows you to do that. But we didn't just stop there with opening procedures. We also updated all of our uh, guides for during the day of the election. So at each station in the voting room, for example, the entrance in the drop box, or the check-in table, or the ballot table, or the voting booths, or the DS200 scanner, we now have a handout. So it's not just in the chief's notebook, it's a separate handout that you can give to those officers or post at those stations that goes over everything they would need to know to perform those duties. And of course, we did the same thing for closing procedures. And you may have noticed we color code each of these. The guides with green at the top were for opening procedures. The ones with yellow at the top were for during the day. And now the ones for, with red are for closing procedures. Here's an example of a guide on the left that shows you how to secure the voted ballots. Again, it would just be something you hand to one or two of your officers, and then you would be there to help support and guide them as they go through those things. We also have checklists for what materials you need to return in what, in what bag or other container. We also, on our training website, have a number of sample filled in forms. So it's not just the form, but it shows you how it has to be filled out. And we tried to make them much easier and simpler this year. For example, the compensation sheet, which is the form that all election officers had to complete in past elections to be paid for election day, still exists, but it's no longer a four page form. Now it's just a one page form. It's much simpler and easier to do. And you have examples of exactly what officers would need to complete on these forms. Or on the right, you have a sample of the election officer evaluation form. That used to be a form that was one page per election officer, and we simplified it in recent years, recent elections, pardon me, to make it a one page form. We do know that the form that's of most concern to first time chiefs is usually the statement of results. The statement of results, for those of you that don't know, it's an unofficial record of the ballots and votes in your precinct. And in the past, it it was kind of an intimidating form, and I get that. What we did is we went back and we looked at that form from start to finish. We looked at what the Virginia Department of Elections 
uh, guidance was for this form. And we said, we think we can make it simpler and easier for election officers to fill out. First off, you would attach the tapes from the DS-200s to the statement of results, and you would no longer need to transcribe the results from those tapes on the statement of results. Second, on the right side there, you see the back of the form. What we used to ask you to do was to do a lot of math. It was things like take this number plus this number and add them up, then subtract them from this number, then add it to this other number, and then subtract it all from this number. We said, we think we can move things around and make that even easier. So now in parts five and six there, you can see all you're doing is writing down a series of numbers and then adding them up at the bottom. And that's it. So there's no more complicated math. It's a very straightforward form. We used it for the first time, the updated form in this past June's election. And we found, and we heard back from all of our chiefs and assistant chiefs that it was much faster to complete and much easier to complete. And everyone seemed to leave earlier from the precinct as a result as well, which was terrific. Next, I wanna make sure you know many important things about how we're gonna support you before and on election day. First off, we are always just a phone call or email away, even on election day itself. And we will never leave you hanging. If you have a question, comment, concern, reach out to us anytime. We check our email all the time. We'll respond uh, as soon as we can. We always have staff here in the office to answer your questions. Uh, and we make sure we get back to you immediately. It's also important to remember that the chief and assistant chief in each precinct are a team that handle all the issues that come up. So it's not just on you if you agree to be the chief to do everything by yourself. By all means, work with your assistant chief, split up the duties and however you find that works well for both of you uh, to accomplish all the things that you need to do. And someone noted to us that this is the best time ever to be a chief. We've gone through, we've updated so many of our documents and resources. We've made things easier than they've ever been before. Uh, that really is the best time to be a chief. Now I wanna turn it over for a moment to my colleague, Abigail, if there's any other information that she would like to share with you about being a first time chief. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Even those of you who are just um, curious about what the process is to become a chief, I'm really glad that you took the time to join us and hope that some of the information sparks your excitement about serving, uh, maybe even in a future election, if not this particular one. Speaking of this particular one though, we do need you. Um, I do want to bring something up that Ravi hasn't touched on yet, which um, might be something of interest to some of you. While we need those 260 blah, blah, blah chiefs to serve as assigned chiefs for this election, if you haven't been chosen for a chief this time, I may be tapping you to be in a reserve chief. So I want you to keep that in mind when you're filling out your availability forms as a, a form where you can mark your interest in certain preferences in serving. We always need lots and lots of backup chiefs. We have cancellations and other just unexpected uh, circumstances. So um, if you are interested and you've checked that you wanna be a chief and you haven't heard from me at some point, I may just tap you for um, a reserve position and we can get more into that when uh, we talk to you individually. Um, I also want to make sure that um, at some future point when you get a follow up email from us where we ask you to, um, if you've already given us your availability, you may not be able to go back into the portal and um, revise your interest in serving as a chief. So if we've turned you around with this webinar, you've decided, yay, I can do this or I want to do this, and you already marked yourself as no, not interested, maybe interested or only interested in AC, we'll give you a chance to update that. And I hope many of you take advantage of that. Um, personally, what I wanted um, all of you to know is that I have a very poor memory. I don't remember names or faces, but I remember things that people tell me about themselves. So if we're communicating and I don't seem to be grasping a former conversation we had, just throw something out there that will remind me that um, we spoke that we connected, tell me your dog's name or what you had for dinner one day, and usually it'll come back to me. I'm very good at responding to people's uh, concerns, so don't hesitate if you're just having quibbles about any part of your service. Happy to um, connect with you and reassure you or talk you through any kinds of concerns you're having about serving, whether it's a first time chief, whether you're a former assistant who is now stepping back into the role of being a chief, or if you're still on the fence, uh, I'm happy to talk to you about any of those kinds of um, 
keep using the word concerns, but that seems to be the general concern. Um, we want to make sure that you're comfortable what you're doing in what you're doing, but we also want to um, acknowledge that we are talking to you specifically because we believe that you are a good fit for this role, either in your past service or our past um, communications with you. Um, something sparked our interest in seeing you in this role. So if we see it in you, you don't see it in yourself, give us a chance to show you what we see. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you, Abigail. And just to be clear, we haven't sent out the, the chief assignments yet, but as Abigail said, when we do, we really do hope that you will agree to accept your chief assignment uh, and that we just need you know, not just 264 chiefs, we probably need more than 300 to cover the cancellations that we that we usually have. So terrific. Now, some of you may be nervous about serving as a chief, especially if you haven't served as an assistant chief before. And we wanna reassure you that you are absolutely prepared to serve as a chief. That was the case for many of us as well that work here in our office or work as trainers. Uh, we were also very nervous the first time. So for me, for example, uh, my very first election, about a week before election day, I got a call saying, you know, someone just canceled, will you be the chief? And I said, no way, uh, I definitely can't do that. Uh, eventually they talked me into it and it's the best decision I ever made because I really did enjoy working with the non-routine voters, being able to help them, being able to um, uh, process them and work with my fellow election officers. It really was a fantastic experience. Uh, that first time, you know, I went in thinking, there's no way that I can do this. There's no way uh, that I'm prepared enough to be able to do this. And within about an hour or two on election day, it felt completely natural. So that's just me, that I was called shortly before election day to do it. Uh, I was very reluctant, but I agreed because it seemed there was a need, uh, but it worked out great. And ever since I've served as a chief, uh, I was very happy to do that capacity. I wouldn't wanna go back to serving as a regular officer. I love serving as a chief or as an assistant chief now. Uh, now I actually work in our office, so it worked out pretty well. Uh, I know we have Beth Methvessel, who is our clerk to the electoral board. I think she's got a similar story if she wants to share. Beth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I served as a chief for probably, oh gosh, maybe 20 years before I took this position as clerk to the electoral board. And my story is somewhat similar to Ravi's, except my first experience as an election officer was very poor. And the reason why is because the chief I served under was not organized. Um, there was very little, obviously very little effort put into pre-election to reading through the chief's notebook, all of the resources that were available, this individual was not familiar um, with them. On election day, this person did not appropriately delegate. And so by the time we closed the polls, everything was just um, in a state of chaos. So uh, the next day, I, I was also a seasonal employee at the time. I told the election manager, take me off. I will never serve again. It was absolutely the worst experience of my life. And so what she said was, well, why don't you be the chief? You can be the one that um, organizes, delegates, and runs the show. And of course, without dating myself too much, I was pretty young at the time, <laughs> And but I agreed to do it. And I was assigned um, for a, I think maybe a special election. And I spent uh, the appropriate amount of time to familiarize myself with the chief's notebook, to, to um, look at my list of election officers, make a pre-election assignment so that my EOs knew right when they came in in the morning what they would be doing when I called to confirm their service. So that's just, and, and then I, I, like Robbie, I loved it and I served um, for many, many years until I took, like Robbie, a job in the office. So, um, so I just wanna stress three things. If you are uh, um, organized, if you um, plan ahead and you, um, delegate responsibilities appropriately, 
And I cannot stress this enough, work with your assistant chief. Um, I, we were a team and we did things um, in, in co coordinate, coordinating with one another and that was invaluable. I, I appreciated that the support of my assistant chief um, and, and don't know how I could have done it without that. And we wound up coming back year after year after year as the same team. And so it was really a well-oiled machine. And my last point is I, I applaud, I cannot say enough about the um, election officer assignment team, the, the, the individuals in the office of election, Ravi and all of the people that will support you and ensure, and in fact, I, I'm one of them because I'm the polling place liaison to make sure that your experiences um, as a chief are, are smooth and issue-free as we can make them. So another amazing resource is our office. So thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Beth. And I think you pointed out a very important part about being a chief, which is there are some things that go into it before election day. So the preparation you do is a big determinant of how successful you'll be as a chief. That it's not just show up on election day. You have to do a few things before election day, uh, but not that much. And we've also done a lot to help make those pre-election tasks a lot easier. For example, in the past, uh, our documentation used to say, you know, send an email to your election officers before election day to check with them and remind them what they need to do. Now, in the chief's notebook, we actually give you an email template. You can just copy and paste it, fill in some information about your specific polling place, and send it off. We want to make things as easy as possible. Um, you know, we've known this change has been coming for about six months, that we would need new chiefs everywhere, and we've been trying to make those changes to make that transition as seamless as possible. Abigail, would you like to share your story of when you served for the first time as a chief or assistant chief? Sure, hi again. Um, there seems to be a theme going here. Many of us were tapped to be chiefs when we either weren't expecting it or weren't entirely on board. Um, in my case, it was for a primary and our regular chief was not available and it fell to me. Um, same as Beth's experience the second time around, I had a phenomenal assistant chief who was so willing to be supportive, but allowing me to do things the way that I uh, felt was natural and the best for the precinct. And um, all of that fear, anxiety, 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 sleeplessness, and anxiety pretty much evaporated when I got into the precinct, knew that I was in control, had the support of the staff, the support of my officers, and knowing that help from my rover was just a phone, well, back then, a walkie-talkie call away. And um, I recognize that people are reluctant to maybe put themselves in uncomfortable positions for the first time, but sometimes it only takes the first time. And after you've gotten your feet wet and you feel that you know what you were doing and you can look back and say, I did that, it was successful. I can do this, it gets easier and easier. So from another very reluctant first time chief, I um, again, encourage everybody to um, allow yourself the opportunity to try this. And I'm almost certain that each of you will find something about it that sparks your interest in coming back again and becoming a regular part of your precinct's leadership team. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you, Abigail. Let's move next to Jean Tenson. Jean, do you want to share your story? Sure. Um, like a lot of uh, the people who've already spoken, I was a first timer. Um, well, let me back up a minute. If you're here today, you're here because you're fascinated by elections. I served for the first time as an election officer in November of 2013 and was just amazed at this whole process that happens behind the scenes. As a voter, you just go and vote you have no idea that there's this army of people uh, that work for months to get everything ready for you to come in, check in, mark your ballot, put it in the scanner. So tw November 2013 was the last time that the governor's office flipped. And so they had to do the same thing that we're going through right now. <clears throat> All the Republican chiefs had to become assistant chiefs and the Democrats had to step up. And now we're going through the reverse process. It's just the natural flow of how we do it in Virginia. So I was really nervous, but 
unbeknownst to me, the chief in 2013 had seen that I was good at, at doing election officer stuff. And so she recommended me to be chief. And then I was paired with her in November 2014 when I served for the first time. And she was incredible, so knowledgeable, so experienced, mentored me, helped me learn how to do stuff. I loved helping voters with issues, finding a way for any eligible voter to cast their ballot. And I felt really well supported by the Office of Elections. They have people standing by on election day to help find people that you can't find in the roles, answering any questions you have. There are, there's a tech support group that answers any questions if you've got problems with um, pull pads or scanners. There's the rover, which I'm now a rover. Um, they, will, they come by and they help the chief and assistant chief as well. Unlike back in 2014 when I became a chief for the first time, it's a lot easier now. The, the notebook, as Ravi mentioned, has been significantly rewritten. I mean, it's almost unrecognizable compared to what it was then. Um, the one-page guides, you haven't seen them yet because you didn't work in, the, in June. They make things so much easier. And there's guides for everything. You just like hand everything out to everybody and say, go do this, go do that. It breaks everything down to just cookbook steps, which makes things easier and it makes you more confident in what you're doing. And if you were an assistant chief um, prior to 2014, you're gonna be amazed at how much more streamlined and straightforward things are now. So I hope you're, you will step up and be a chief because we really need you. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. And Jean's a little, being a little bit humble, she's one of the folks who helped uh, update that chief's notebook to where it is now. Uh, next, we have Leonard Bambaka, who's a rover and a trainer. Leonard, would you like to share your story? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I came, I started, um, I believe 2012 was my first election. I, um, in this county, um, no matter where you are, you don't stay a rookie for long. Um, they, if, if you're interested, if you, if um, the opportunities are there, I showed up at the second election with a calculator and the chief put me to work on the SORs in a split precinct. Um, so um, I, uh, I moved towards assistant chief. The note, the, again, as Gene was saying, um, in November 2014, this was the first election where, um, that I had seen, but it was an election, it was a turnover election. And the dynamics, to be honest, um, are, are um, something to work with because a lot of chiefs have really built up a system. There's a lot of ownership about how that precinct is set up. And um, a lot of these things have been learned by experience and trial and error. And mine was the case as I went to what was then Stewart um, High School Justice, Michael Whalen, who's on this um, Zoom session, was uh, my assistant chief, but he was my mentor. And uh, we established a very good working relationship right away. Um, it's tough sometimes turning your precinct, I put that in quotes, over to somebody. But I asked him, I said, Michael, please just show me everything that you're doing to make this thing work. And I could not have asked for a better training experience at, at, at the beginning. So Michael, I want to do a shout out of uh, your way here. And wherever you're going, OK, that precinct is going to be in good hands. Um, one of the things that's really key for me as a chief election officer, as, when, when I was a chief election officer, is to take care of your EOs. If somebody's coming in and being difficult, you need to take that person off um, and let the EOs do their job. Uh, take care of your EOs, make sure that things, as Beth was saying, are organized, that people see value in the work, and that you send them home on time. Um, because these are the people that really make things run. And these are also your future leaders. Identify that talent and let the election office know um, about these people. Don't keep it a secret. And of course, speaking of the elections office, I always knew the elections office had my back. Anytime I needed, had a question, even if it was a stupid question, they were very patient with me and worked through that. So I'm very thankful for that. And um, I had a tremendous experience starting out as chief. Thank you. Thanks, Leonard. And I can also affirm that the office is happy to answer many stupid questions because I used to submit them myself. So I definitely know that. Uh, next, we've got Sandy Robeck and then Gary Klinger. Thank you, Ravi. I uh, just want to relate my first experience, my horror story that turned out to be excellent. Uh, I had been an election officer for a few years. I was asked to be an assistant. 
and I was at a new school I had never been at that school and at four o'clock in the morning I get a phone call that my chief's husband was having a heart attack and they're heading to the emergency room so you're in charge so <laughs> And also, this was the days when there was school activities the night before, so we couldn't really set up in the gym uh, as we are able to now. But uh, so obviously, I was beside myself and head in. It was just incredible the amount of support I got from the rover, from the office, from everybody. And uh, it just went smoothly. We were able to open on time. And fortunately, uh, the chief's husband, it turned out to be a false alarm, and she was able to show up late in the afternoon. We were able to close. So... Uh, Having survived that and learned a lot, uh, I, it was really uh, a, turned out to be a good experience. And I like to ditto what everybody said, but I would just like to give you a personal uh, thought about it. For me, working the elections, being chief, is just the incredible support we get from the community. There's always an occasional, someone has an argument with something, but it's so many people come, thanks us for everything. And what really encourages me is when you see someone, and you can look on the, uh, the poll book, who's like a hundred years old, that comes walking in to vote and says, I've been voting since whatever, since I've been 20 years old, or the first time voter coming in with their parents and everybody's happy. And it just, uh, just reinforces, uh, for me, what we're doing and how important it is, especially with all the news throughout the country. But uh, to me, it's just a great experience and something I'm going to continue to do as long as I can. Thank you, Sandy. I think you hit the nail on the head. It is a serving as a chief is a tremendous sense of uh, civic duty and serving your community. Um, and you know, as Beth said, if if you've served under a chief who you didn't care for or wasn't doing things the way you wanted, this is the opportunity to do them the right way. So. Uh, next, we've got Gary and then Bill. I first served as an assistant chief in June of 2008. And 12 years ago, uh, with the change of uh, party of governors, I uh, became as chief for the first time at a dual precinct location. And back in those days, we had the Winfo touchscreen machines, which connected uh, wirelessly. And it was a challenge having two precincts trying to connect, download, close up at the same time. Everything had gone pretty well up until that point at the end of the day. And I was actually on the phone with tech support trying to get our machines closed when the Gene Rakowski, the chief of the other precinct who already finished everything over there came over. And while I was on the phone, was able to close us down you know, without even any help. And I just want to add that notwithstanding, it was not the best closing uh, one could have asked for. Uh, it did not uh, ban me forever from uh, progressing. Uh, I got recruited as a, uh, uh, to be a rover within a year after that. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, next, we've got Bill. Bill, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. There we go. Am I okay now? Yep, all set. Okay. I, I uh, started as an election officer uh, after 28 years in the Army and as sort of not necessarily being chief, but as a, as a term of service. Military people are not supposed to uh, engage in politics, and that's the way I look at it working in a, in a precinct. It's a good way to get away from politics for a while because we're not allowed to have any political dis, uh, discussions. Rather, we're performing a service to the voters to make their voting experience as efficient and easy as possible. The other thing is that I was an election officer and an assistant chief before becoming a chief. And I imagine a lot of people in our, our audience today are in the same situation. So it was probably a, a more uh, frightening proposition to become an election officer in the first place than it was to become a chief later on, because by that time I had gone through and knew all the functions of a precinct. And, and I think what you, what you should do is, have you been an election officer? Think back if what the chiefs and assistant chiefs you've served with uh, did well and what they didn't do well and use that as a guidepost. Those are, those are my remarks. Thank you, Bill, for sharing that. I appreciate it. 
Uh, next, we have Larry and then Leslie. Well, following Bill, I can say that my experience was almost exactly the same. Uh, I came into, a, became a Virginia citizen after being in the Navy for 26 years. First started as, a, uh, as an election officer, uh, found it very rewarding, as someone else has said, several others have said about being able to work with the voters um, and, and help them to vote. Um, I was recruited to become either an assistant chief or as chief, depending on where the, uh, the party of the governor was at the time. But I got to say that my experience was that it is indeed a team. Um, it was very, very um, transparent uh, in the, uh, the teamwork between the chief and the assistant chief, whichever side I was on, that we were both working with our election officers to get things done. I also have to support what Robbie mentioned uh, before and that uh, someone said that there's um, there's no better time to be a chief or an assistant chief than right about now. I remember back when we first started, uh, when I first got into the elections in Fairfax County, it was really a complicated process with not a lot of, uh, of uh, automation to help us along. There was a lot of crossing out sequential numbers to check people in, but now it's become a whole lot easier and, uh, and the procedures have become very straightforward. Uh, so the transition from an election officer uh, to an assistant chief or uh, a chief, as I hope many of you will become, uh, has become very much easier in these last few years. Um, that said, uh, I, like several of the other trainers who are on here, are looking forward to seeing you as a, as a chief and, uh, and um, and hope that uh, you're on uh, Rover 16's route. As a chief who used to be on Rover 16's route, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Uh, and last, we have Leslie. And then we'll go into all of your questions. Uh, so if you do have a question that you'd like to ask us, feel free to use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, I believe you can access that at the bottom of your screen using the reactions button. Uh, but before that, Leslie. Yes, hello. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Okay, that's good. Uh, my path to being a chief seems to be pretty much easier than some of the other stories I've heard here today. Uh, I had a lot of experience before I became a chief uh, working satellite and early voting as a trainer before I became a chief. Uh, the one thing I want to emphasize that I think Beth mentioned the effort you put in before election day will pay off in spades. So the more you communicate expectations for your staff, give them their assignments, when things kick off at 5 a.m., you know, everybody knows what they're supposed to do. They're well-trained, they have information, and things will go a lot smoother. So good luck to everyone. Hope you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Leslie. So that was a variety of folks who work here in our office sharing their stories about how they uh, became a chief or the challenges they may have faced the first time or just the excitement they had uh, when they became a chief. And I hope that gives you a better picture of what's involved, uh, what may be asked of you, but also that none of us quite felt prepared, uh, fully prepared the first time we became a chief and that it was kind of just going through that experience and, and seeing uh, what it was like and, and working our way through it. So with that, now we want to turn over to all of you. We have three questions for you. So number one, what are your questions or concerns about being a chief? Number two, what makes you nervous about agreeing to be a chief? Or number three, what can we do to help you say yes to being a chief? So as I said, feel free to use the raise hand feature and we can call on people one at a time. Uh, I don't see anyone that's raised their hand yet. So again, you can access that using the reactions button at the bottom of the uh, Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then we'll call on people one at a time and we'll hopefully answer your questions and see if we can get to yes for all of you. So I see Louisa first. So Louisa, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much. I have a kind of a negative thing. Um, so I'll get that out of the way so we can get back to the positives. You guys are all very inspirational. Thanks for um, structuring this, this meeting this way. It's very good. So I'm gonna look at worst case scenarios. Um, we have schools that are unprepared for you know, lockdown situations. 
Um, who, who's to say that doesn't happen also for us who are volunteers, you know, a couple of hours here and there, and then assume somehow we're in charge of an entire facility. And of course we know in 2020, we saw threats and confrontation in polling places and also pressure on election officers afterwards in contested places. Now, we all hope that that's like a one-time thing because it's never gonna happen again. But anyway, what's the training to handle all that? So let me make sure I understand that the question. You're asking what is the training that we're gonna prepare and offer to help you deal with just situations that occur uh, at the polling place that are not related to voting? Right, suppose we get it, you know, the places in Georgia and all kinds of places that horrible, horrible 2020 situation. Okay, we all hope it doesn't happen, but we need to be prepared. Who, you know, we can't predict. So do you, are you guys tracking and assessing and what is the training? Sure, so let me start by saying, first off, we of course have your backs as chiefs, assistant chiefs, regular officers. The job of our office is to support and prepare you and to help you with any of those things that may come up. Uh, we've dealt with a lot of them. You know, we don't um, talk about all of those individually, but we've dealt with a number of different situations, a uh, number of different thorny situations. We get calls in the office every election. Uh, we've dealt with them. Sometimes we've had to uh, ask for the police to be called to deal with certain situations. Sometimes uh, we've had to work with the local uh, political party committees uh, to see if there's something that they can assist us with. But we're used to dealing with those types of things. Um, you know, on the first day of early voting here in for the November 2020 presidential election, when we had uh, in-person absentee voting going on at our office building, we had hundreds of protesters outside. And we've dealt with all these things here. We, we have some experience with them, and we can absolutely provide you guidance on how to deal with them at your precinct if it, if it were to happen. Uh, I also want to let you know that before every general election, we do a security meeting. We meet with the police and the sheriffs and other individuals from the county to discuss what are possible situations that may arise in each election, what are the things that we're going to do? Um, we prepare contingency measures for every polling place. We have two backup locations uh, assigned to them so that if for some reason voting couldn't continue at your polling place, you know where you could go instead. And the very first page of the chief's notebook has, you know, uh, emergency contact numbers uh, for police and other groups that you may need to reach out to. So I would say that I understand that that's a concern, uh, but I want to assure you that we do everything we can to help support you. Um, I don't expect anything like what happened in Georgia or Arizona or other places in Virginia. Virginia is different. Uh, I'm very proud to be a Virginia citizen. I don't expect us to, to have to deal with those same issues. Uh, we were fortunate last year, the November 2021 election, in, in um, the year after a presidential election, there are only two states that have a major election. We're one of them. We had the, the nation's focus on us, and I think we held ourselves pretty well, uh, all things considered. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, uh, let's see, we've got Dominic next. Go ahead and unmute yourself and fire away. Yeah, thank you, Robbie. Um, I just wanted to thank you all. Um, I've never even been an election officer, so whatever you folks think I can best do, I'm I'm kind of willing to help out and just pitch in. Um, my question is, I would assume, for example, if there's a shortage of personnel and someone like me who could basically barely tread water, right? was asked to serve as a as a chief. I would assume basically I'm a figurehead and I'm gonna rely on that assistant chief because of their experience. My question would be though, um, if there were some type of operational problem that needed um, a decision to be made, I would certainly defer to the assistant chief for their advice. But would there be cases where that would be inappropriate because of the party demarcation Meaning, would the assistant chief have to recuse herself or himself from providing the chief with any, let's say, advice on how to handle a certain situation? Thank you. Sure. So let's take those two questions uh, separately. So for the second one, um, would a, a chief or assistant chief have to recuse themselves? I can't think of a situation in which that would happen. Um, I don't know if Beth uh, can think of anything like that. You know, the chief and assistant chief work as a team. Uh, and ultimately, if you both can't agree on something, it's the chief who makes the final decision. So by all means, get the advice and input from the assistant chief and the other officers, and then the chief makes that decision. Um, and then for your first question about, you know, you've never been a chief, an officer before and you're with us today. Uh, this Zoom was targeted at, at individuals who've served at least once before, but we know we have some folks here that haven't. Um, it's, it's not common that that happens, that we have a first time officer serving as a chief. So we're gonna start by seeing how many experienced officers we have that can be a chief when we hope we have enough to fill every precinct and then we'll see where we stand. So uh, I appreciate you joining us today. I'm glad you're excited about potentially serving as a chief, 
but I hope we can get you at least one election as a regular officer before we ask you to serve as a chief. Beth, is there anything else that you can think of uh, that situation where someone might need to recuse themselves? No, I, I don't think there's any provision for that in statute either. Um, on election day, I mean, you are assigned based on your your partisan preference and and um, but on election day, it is it is a team. The chief and the assistant chief work very closely together. As as you said, the ultimate decision is the chief's. Um, but there are certain situations where the decision is made by the entire election team. So no, there is no recusal. But a good question. Thank you for it. Thanks, Beth. Uh, next, we have George. Thanks to everybody for uh, providing this training. Uh, I have been an election official a couple of times, but I feel better about volunteering now. Thank you. Uh, my first question is, how do, how do I go about volunteering to be a chief? And then my other question was, are there any other functions that are done on election day where the chief needs to be aware of party affiliation? Thank you. Thanks, George. I'll let Abigail take the first part of your question, and I'll take the second. Hi, George. Thanks for uh, the interest. Um, as I said, when we send out the availability email, there is a section where you can mark your preferences for what kind of um, service you're interested in, as well as things like distance traveled and other roles. If you haven't had an opportunity to do that yet, by all means, go ahead and mark that, that you're interested in serving as a chief. If you've already marked your availability and you maybe skipped that or you've changed your mind in some way, um, you can always shoot us an email. I'd be happy to update that. As far as um, I've seen a couple of questions pop up about how do I know where I'll be assigned? Can I say where I'm going to be assigned? Um, that's a puzzle I put together over a long period of time, depending on availability, matching up experience with possibly inexperienced people. Um, there's a particular challenge this time because of COVID. A number of people simply couldn't serve for two years in a row. And so what I would consider their regular assignment may now be comfortably in the hands of a different set of leaders. I'm looking at all of that individually. I don't just roll the dice. So um, certainly if you have specific um, preferences, concerns, um, do want to serve with somebody that you know you have a good rapport with and you think you make a good team. I'm open to hearing all of that from you. As I said, just kind of remind me who you are when you write to me. Let me know where, maybe where you've served in the past, if you can remember the precinct number or name or the person that you served with. I'm happy to work with you individually on finding the right spot. Long term, my goal is to find good homes for chiefs so that you can experience some sense of ownership and whether officers come and go over the years for any number of reasons, we have some stability there. And so that's my goal. I hope that um, for some of you, maybe that's not as important as uh, it is for others and you're willing to be flexible, fill in where needed. Um, but certainly any of you who um, whose minds have um, still not been made up after this and you're still a maybe, I would still like to hear from you, even if you're a maybe. It puts you on my radar. I know what I'm working with as far as laying all the pieces on the board. So um, basically keep in touch, let us know as your thinking evolves and keep the questions coming. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. And so for the second part of your question about um, do you have to take party affiliation into consideration on election day? Uh, so for most tasks, no. Uh, for most things that you're doing on election day, uh, party affiliation doesn't come into play, but there are some. So for example, uh, there are some uh, tasks where we'll ask you to use two officers and by statute, uh, by the Code of Virginia, we'll ask you to use officers of two different political affiliations if possible. So an example of that would be when officers go outside to assist curbside voters. Uh, the Code of Virginia prescribes that curbside voters, when practicable, should be assisted by two election officers of different party affiliations. Um, sometimes it's not possible if the precinct is just really crazy, you have really big lines, but we really want that to happen, that you have two officers go outside, ideally of different party affiliations, uh, to be able to do that. There's a few others uh, when it comes time to signing things or things like that, but for the most part, no. Um, you do receive a precinct roster that identifies everyone's political affiliation. You don't have to go and ask them. You'll know who the officers representing the Republican Party are, who the officers representing the Democratic Party are, 
and who the officers that are unaffiliated are. Uh, one thing I will also mention though, is that here in Fairfax County, we have about twice as many officers represent the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. So we try our best to have a 50-50 party balance, and we're really hoping that this year we're going to get closer and ever closer than ever to that target. But if you know of someone uh, who has an interest in potentially serving, please encourage them to apply. Not in October. The time is now to apply, so we can get them in, get all their paperwork, and they have plenty of time to get trained and assigned. Uh, so yes, so political affiliation comes into play in a few areas on election day, but not most. Uh, next, I think we've got William Sinat. William, do you have a question for us? There you go. Yeah, had to unmute okay. there. Sorry, Ravi. Yep, go ahead. I, I have a handful of questions, but I just make a couple of statements and maybe some of the other guys can go first. Uh, number one, uh, I think the briefing was excellent. It was clear, concise, very articulate, and I could understand every word. Number two, I think the testimonies was uh, uh, convincing, and it's very clear that the election board is a composite of excellent communicators. And number three, my experience before, I've worked at the Central Precinct at one time. I've worked at about four or five other precincts periodically as an election official. And then I'll hold my questions till after we finish with the rest of these folks to give them a chance because I got a number of questions I'd like to ask. Okay, sure. sure. Those are some nice comments. I was waiting for the butt. Uh, so we'll see, but uh, thank you for those. Uh, so let's go to Bruno next. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, this will be the first election under a number of recently changed election rules and guidelines. Uh, are there some of them that you think are important enough to note during this briefing? You're asking if there are any legal changes uh, this year? No, I'm, are... I'm thinking of, you know, there are some changes that we know of, a no photo ID and so on. Will chiefs in this cycle face same day voter registration requests? That's a significant change. Definitely, and that's a great question. So let's take each of those two. It's an so important question. Mm -hmm. So in terms of acceptable IDs, the law changed in 2020 uh, to allow for an increased set of IDs that were acceptable uh, to check in, some of which no longer uh, require a photo on them. So we've had that in place now for about two years. Uh, and that's what our training and our materials all incorporate. And I just want to be clear, we don't make the decision on that. The General Assembly makes the decision on that. Uh, and our job is simply to, to carry out the, the laws set by the General Assembly on that. So whatever any of our personal feelings are about uh, IDs or any other laws that are in effect, our office's job and your job as election officers and potentially chiefs would be to carry those out. For the second one, for same-day voter registration, yes. So same-day voter registration will be in effect. It'll be new for this November's election. Uh, I'm, I'm actually on a work group on the state that's figuring out some of the policies and procedures related to it. And what I can tell you is that same-day voter registration will be handled like a, it will be handled as a provisional ballot. So what will happen is if you have a voter who comes in and says, you know, I'm not registered or I need to update my registration, for you as the chief, what you're going to ask them to do is two very simple things. One, complete a voter registration form. And two, have them complete a provisional ballot. And then those two materials will come back to us in the office immediately after the election. We'll review every voter registration form to see if it can be processed or not. And if it can be, uh, then that provisional ballot goes to our electoral board and we would make a recommendation as to whether or not that ballot could be counted. But ultimately, of course, it's the electoral board's decision. So same-day voter registration is just another one of those laws that has been passed. Uh, I think it was actually passed two years ago with the delayed enactment date of 2022. Uh, and so we're getting ready for that. The state has been giving us, the State Department of Elections has been giving us some guidance on the policies and procedures, and they're still finalizing some things. But that will absolutely be covered in the training and the chief's briefing that we prepare for this coming election. So great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's the big one for me. I think that's uh, it could be time consuming, but I think the solution you uh, you mentioned is perfect. Thank you. Right, yeah, we're definitely not asking you to, to process that registration. So just Great. another provisional. Great. So we do expect Thank more you. provisionals than ever before, uh, <laughs> but just another provisional. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we've got David Lopez. Hi, 
Okay, can you hear me all right now? Yep, we can hear you great. Thanks, Ravi. Um, uh, thank you for, I got your questions and no, I, there's nothing that makes me particularly nervous. Uh, one thing I did wanna ask about though, my experience from the last election that we had was uh, I worked at a precinct where the chief was a last minute change because the, uh, the assigned chief to that precinct was injured the day before or something like that. So he was not familiar with the uh, equipment that we had at our precinct. And, um, and that's the one thing that concerns me right now is that uh, what saved us and what enabled us to get opened on time at that precinct was several of the election officers agreed to come in the day before elections and we spent a few hours, uh, full, a, few, a few full hours of getting familiar with all the stuff that was available to us and get, getting things set up. Um, so that's the only thing that uh, concerns me just a little bit was if you waited until the day of election, the two hours you have, I think it is before the polls open to try and get stuff set up, that's a tough challenge. And um, uh, I saw on the chat box there, somebody asked a question and you guys did, gave a good answer uh, that there will be time when we can come familiarize ourselves with the equipment and, and everything. And uh, so that uh, it should go quicker. And I think that's foremost on my mind as a as a prospective new chief was would be to really know what's in that box and and be ready to distribute and assign uh tasks to the rest to the election officers at the precinct um that's all i had thank you thanks david and i think you you highlighted a good point you know sometimes we've had last minute chiefs assigned and we try our best to get them trained and prepared for election day but a lot of it is up to them. It's um, how studious they are in terms of looking at these things. It's not a huge commitment. I don't wanna uh, make anyone think that you're gonna spend days and days. I saw a question in the chat box that said, this looks like four full days of time, not at all. Um, but it does require some work before election day. And the reason we wanna do this now, the reason we're starting in July for a November election is because we wanna do everything possible to get to having you know more than 300 people ready to be a chief this year to withstand however many cancellations we might have. Uh, let's see, next we have Barton. Hi, thank you. Um, a couple of comments and then a, a question. Uh, for Dominic, um, uh, just a comment on his question about, um, uh, you know, as a rookie and questions and deferring to the assistant. You know, ultimately, everything that you need to do and any question you have, you know, you have your policies, your book to look, refer to, and you discuss it with your assistant. And then there's the phone to call the election office. So usually, but you call the election office, you get your answer, it's done. There's, I, I can see no no scenario where, you know, you'd be, you'd, you'd be any kind of conflict because of party or anything like that. But the bottom line is you got the phone, the phone call away to is you know you got an answer uh, from the election board. Um, I was in, I've been an assistant the last few years at uh, at Aldrin and um, and um, one you know so I'm uh, you know taking the step up to uh, to chief you know is a, a little bit of a step and uh, and of course once I uh, considered and agreed uh, to do this I immediately called my chief, my former chief, to ask if he is going to be working the, the polls on, on in November and would he be willing to be my assistant? And he said yes. So while we didn't see eye to eye on everything, overall we got along pretty good. So I uh, immediately, you know, fired off another email to Abigail and told her that he was willing to be my assistant because we worked well together. And, um, and so I expect, uh, you know, this way he can uh, catch some of my little errors and, you know, and I'll catch his. Uh, it'll be. It will be nice to be able to have the final say on a few of the little things that we we dis, you know disagreed on, right? Um, but uh, but that's what I would recommend if for any of you that are assistants is that if you agree to do this, to reach out for your your former chief and see if they're willing to you know act as your assistant. And if not, maybe one of your uh, better um, election officers that's uh, in the other party, you know, and see if they're willing to, to become a, uh, an assistant chief and then pass that on. Uh, Cause like, like, like everybody's saying, we need to recruit a lot of uh, assistant and chiefs. Um, the, uh, the questions uh, though, that I'd like to throw out there. Um, I'm sorry. 
Uh, the um, uh, we did run into that issue, the issues of um, uh, last last um, last year with COVID, um, uh, and where we were basically enforcing Fairfax County's mask policy in the schools. And uh, you know the you know the we while well, we were you know we knew that we weren't allowed to interfere with their right to vote, but to ask them to put on a mask, some no problem. Some would take took offense of it uh, initially. You know, it was conflicting information coming out of the election board, phone calls, uh, and this is going to to the satellite before we even got to election day, and then also on election day where we had uh, you know different direction, you know, but asking them to step outside and do a a, a curbside voting outside and back and forth. The bottom line is we were asked to enforce Fairfax County's policy. And while we're not in a mask situation, mandatory mask situation in Fairfax schools right now, um, we may be in November with the new variant. So uh, while you all aren't the decision makers on that, uh, I, I would like to pass that on to make sure when those discussions come up, that it's not going to happen. You know, the um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, leaders uh, a lot that I had talked to, I mean, chiefs that I talked to, and this is the chiefs, uh, you know, really didn't want to get in the middle of all that. And, uh, and, and I think it should be clear that, um, you know, we're not going to, you know, there, uh, there was even some complaints about interfering with their right to vote. So, uh, you know, so we need to make sure we have a clear policy on that and it's consistent and it's not changing, you know, twice, you know, two or three times during election day. Okay. Um, and uh, let me take a moment to address that. I'm happy to take any other questions. So I think you brought up a really good point that last November's election was stressful for a lot of officers because of face mask policies, either required by the state or by the county. None of that is in effect for this November's election. So no voter is required to wear a face mask to vote inside or outside the polling place. Um, in terms of guidance from our office, uh, all I'll say for right now is we've had a, um, some changes at the top, right? We have a new general registrar, a new deputy registrar, a new chairman of the electoral board, and each of them have affirmed um, that we're going to carry out what the policies are of the county, and the county and the state do not require face masks for any voter. Uh, last year, there was you know some middle grounds attempted, uh, things like hold the line to vote or ask a voter to step outside. We're not doing any of that. So none of you are going to be asked to be mask police. Uh, and furthermore, in terms of election officers having to wear face masks uh, or do anything like that, no, because all of that went away. Uh, I think it was in March of this year, the Virginia Department of Labor, Department of Labor issued guidance uh, that affected all uh, government employees in the state. And as election officers, you're technically a government employee. So no, you're, as election officers, as of right now, you're not going to be asked to wear a face mask. The only way that would change, I believe, is if Fairfax County uh, moves into a high transmission rate. Uh, and then if the county has a policy requiring face masks for employees, then that might affect election officers. But as of right now, that's not the case. And obviously we're very far away from November. Um, but I hope that helps reassure all of you uh, about what is likely to be uh, in effect in November. As of right now, we don't expect any changes. Well, I'm sorry, you. it sounded like you had a follow-up question. Well, well, no, that, no, that, yeah, well, that, that, on that question, um, you know, you answered basically answered it, but as you pointed out, you know, November is further away, and it, and you know, if the transmission rates with this new variants rise, you know, things could change between now and November. But again, if it's only about, uh, you know, whether we need to wear masks is one thing. If we're trying to enforce it for voters coming in, that's another another story. So you answered that question, so I appreciate that. Um, the only other comment I want to make, and again, um, that that may just to help uh, alleviate some confusion. It's a, it's a little bit off the subject here, but you know, somebody pointed out how uh, you know both postcards went out with telling everybody w where their precincts were and that their new congressional districts and senate districts and everything. And I don't know how many people actually pay attention to that, or people are going to just show up at their precinct and vote. And I don't know how much of an issue will become, but the website if you ever try, if you try to look up and confirm uh your your personal your own uh uh uh, Senate district, congressional district, mine all changed around. And I go online to try to find out, you know, to confirm that what's on the card was accurate. And it's telling me that, you know, I'm in District 7, uh, you know, Senate District 7 down in the middle of Virginia somewhere. But the they, the new the new, uh, the new new map puts District 7 up here. Uh, I am in District 7 for whatever 
particular that was. Uh, but the problem is, is that all the websites uh, that are out there are still old maps and old numbers. So there may be some confusion. So if the Department of Elections, whether it's at the state level, I'm just passing it on so you can pass it on to leadership to, to see if we can get the accurate maps of us uh, of of the new precincts and districts and you know congressional districts and uh, Senate districts and del House of Delegate District out there on the front. So when the, you know somebody on usability on the websites so that uh, right down in the forefront of the of the website and maybe it'll help save some confusion uh, at the polls on election day. And I'll stop ram I'll stop rambling. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think you bring up a good point that, you know, we did go undergo the um, the every 10 year process for redistricting earlier this year, that we went from 247 precincts in Fairfax County to 264, 10 precincts were eliminated. We have 27 new precincts uh, and about a hundred precincts had their boundaries changed in some way. But even with all those changes, 96% of voters are still going to be voting at the same polling place. So that's number one. Most people, as long as they go to the same place, will be able to vote um, without issue. The, the way that the Supreme Court of Virginia um, did the redistricting maps is they basically changed the numbers everywhere. So what used to be, as you pointed out, you know, what might have been District 1 used to be in the southern part of Virginia is now in the northern part of Virginia. Um, so in many cases, your district numbers may have changed, but the representatives who uh, we're representing or are going to run for the new district might be the very same person. Um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be very much a, a public education campaign. Uh, the Office of Public Affairs for Fairfax County is uh, helping us with making sure voters are educated about these processes. But the biggest thing is going to be a, a lot of outside organizations will also be telling voters, hey, make sure you know where you have to go and vote. And then often what will happen, this happened to me 10 years ago, uh, I didn't know I'd been redistricted. My neighbor told me uh, about you know a month before election day. And once someone knows and they'll help their voters, their neighbors know that's gonna be a part, big part of this as well. So now we, we know it, we're hoping to be ready for it and we're gonna do everything we can to, to make sure voters understand that process as well. Uh, I also saw a comment before we go to our next uh, question from someone in the chat about the role of the Rover. So I wanted to make sure I address that for a moment for those of you who might not be aware. We have about 30 Rovers here in Fairfax County. These are individuals who have often been a chief or assistant chief before and their job is to support about 10 to 12 precincts on election day. Their job is not to supervise the chief, it's to support the chief. If you have a question about something, if you have an issue with something, as a chief, you could reach out to your rover before election day or on election day, and they can help you out with that. And of course, we're here in the office, lots of staff here in the office to answer any other questions. Uh, let's see, uh, I think we've got David next. David, if you wanna ask your question. Hi, uh, Ravi. Thanks a lot for doing this. Uh, it's really great. Um, I wanted to know, could there be any personal liability for decisions that we are going to have to make um, on election day as the chief? In other words, like, could a voter end up suing me for some decision that I'm making that day? Or am I considered, you know, an employee of the county and covered by some kind of, um, you know, where I don't have personal liability? Sure. So let me take my best uh, to tackle that. Let me say, first off, I am definitely not a lawyer. Um, but what I can say is that when you're hired as an election officer, you're a, a paid employee of the Office of Elections usually, right? That's why you receive a stipend after election day. Um, and I have seen, you know, we follow election legislation in other states. Uh, I think there was a state recently that did allow for potentially an election officer to be sued. I'm not aware of anything like that in Virginia. Um, I've never heard of it happening, certainly. Uh, Beth, uh, I don't know if you have anything you want to chime in on this, but no, I, I, as of right now, I am not aware of anything that would make an, an election officer individually liable for anything, uh, nor anything impending that would change that. Beth? Um, my only caveat to that is that Virginia did pass the Virginia Voters' Rights Act, and there is, um, and I'm not intimately acquainted with all of the details of that particular legislation. Um, so I, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, yes, there is some liability. But the point of, of a section of that legislation was to ensure that um, certain um, sensitive minority groups do not feel um, uh, that they're being denied access to the ballot. I'm, I'm just really generalizing this language. 
and there is some repercussions to it, to um, possibly election officials that are actively engaging in that type of activity. So there, there is that. But once again, if this is something, a general question like, I mean, I, is there, am I going to get in trouble for the, <laughs> anything else? I, I can't. In all the years that I, I served as a chief, I, I don't recall that ever being an issue. Um, so, and this, and this legislation that passed is, is fairly new. Um, so I, I hope that helps and doesn't muddle the waters, but I, I do want you to be aware that there is a, um, some legislation out there to protect um, access to the ballot for certain sensitive minority. No, no yeah, uh, that's that's perfect. Uh, okay. That's basically the the reassurance I wanted to have. And okay, you know, I heard I heard you earlier, Ravi, how you said that you guys will have our backs um, if we have questions, if there's tough decisions to be made. And obviously, if I was a chief, I wouldn't be making anything tough decisions in a vacuum. So um, thank you very much for the info. Sure. And yeah, we really do mean it when we say we have your backs. You know, um, we at individual precincts, it's rare that you have to deal with an issue. But just because something might something might happen in one percent of places, that means it won't happen for most of you. But it means we deal with it in terms of supporting a precinct on election day. So I've absolutely been on the phone when I've had to, you know, tell election officers to go home for one reason or another. When I've had to tell a chief, yeah, you need to call the police for that situation, um, you know, or that that situation is not acceptable. You need to deal with it this way. We deal with all those things and we're used to them. Um, by being by far the largest county in Virginia, uh, I think we have more than, was it two and a half times as many precincts as the next largest county. We just deal with these things much more than anyone else does. And so a jurisdiction that only has, let's say 10 precincts, it's very rare they might have to deal with something. We deal with different things, you know, every year and we're, we're ready and used to them. Uh, let's see, next we've got, looks like Jean. Jean, is there something you want to say? Yeah, I just want to do a couple of follow up comments. Um, one to David just now. Um, if there's anything at all that you are not sure about when making a decision, you as a chief or assistant chief, you call the office and they they will walk you through it step by step. So I don't think you have to be worried that somebody's going to sue you for a decision because anything that's really sticky, you're going to have gotten input and guidance on from the office. Um, and for a couple of other folks who've mentioned issues about party affiliation, what party you represent, or partisanship, um, I'd like to emphasize that as a chief and an assistant chief and as an election officer, you're neutral. We are nonpartisan on election day. Um, someone at once, I, I don't know which chief to attribute this to, but says on election day, we are all Switzerland. So. The party affiliation thing is really more an administrative issue in terms of making sure that you send a D and an R out for a curbside voter than it is a practical matter. And in fact, as a chief and assistant chief, your ears and eyes are open, making sure that your election officers aren't discussing political matters or the news or reading materials that might be considered partisan in some way or another. Thanks, Gene. I guess just following up on that. So you all know that here in Virginia, we don't register voters by party. Um, we don't have you know closed primaries like they do in other states. But the Code of Virginia very specifically does require us to assign uh, an equal number of election officers of each party affiliation. And I think that's actually uh, not a bad thing. It means that when someone questions the process, no one can say, oh, but you only had officers of this party serving at the, the polling place. No, by law. Uh, we do our best to try and assign an equal number. Um, and when you serve as a chief or an assistant chief, you're helping carry that out. So your duties are nonpartisan, but the reason that I assume that the state legislature uh, asked for election officers to be party affiliated is to help create um, and reinforce that sense of this is a, a process that is, um, not that it can't be questioned, but that it is being carried out by officers of both party affiliations, as well as officers may be unaffiliated. Uh, next, we've got Richard, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for doing this, Ravi. Uh, about 10 years ago, working as an election officer, I got uh, a question or two about how the uh, ballots were being counted and recorded, uh, whether an actual paper record of ballots is being created and maintained uh, 
um, in uh, parallel with the uh, computer tally. Uh, I would expect similar questions this year, um, given the environment, um, and given the propriety of those questions. Uh, will we learn the answer to these things and taught on how to communicate this information? Yeah, absolutely. So let me answer that in two ways. So number one, we just in the last week published uh, a very detailed series of frequently asked questions on our website. So if anyone has questions about uh, the voting process, election integrity, how we secure ballots or voting machines, they can go to our website, fairfaxcounty.gov slash elections. And near the top of the page, there's a link now uh, for FAQs. So that's number one. Uh, number two, if it, you know, in terms of specifically the ballots themselves and how the votes are counted, the way that things used to work here in Virginia is we used voting equipment that were referred to as DREs, direct, uh, direct recording equipment. Basically, it was used to vote on a touchscreen and there was no paper record of each vote. Uh, so a number of years ago uh, in Fairfax County, we moved to something different and the state has since uh, made this mandatory for everyone. We now move to, move to a paper ballot based system. That's why every voter now completes a paper ballot, scans it on the machine, so the machine makes it easier, right? It tabulates the results for you. But if there's any question of impropriety, we have that all those paper ballots. Um, and it does sometimes happen here in Virginia and other states where we'll go back and uh, take a look at those paper ballots. If there's a recount, those paper ballots get rescanned. We don't just have to trust the machine's word for it. We can take those same ballots, scan them on a different machine and make sure the results are the exact same. So uh, I hope that provides confidence for not just all of us as election officers, but for voters as well. Uh, I love that we use paper ballots uh, and in terms of election security and integrity, it's a, it's a great thing that we moved to that. Even though now, you know, some people may say it's not as convenient as, as voting on a touchscreen, but paper is the way to go when it comes to elections. Uh, let's see, we are at 2.20, so let's finish up in about 10 minutes. I see we've got four more people with their hands raised, so we'll make sure we get their questions and then we'll, we'll call it a day today. So we've got Richard, go ahead, Richard. Oh, wait, we just Richard, I'm sorry. Uh, we got William next. All right, hold on, unmute. I gotta figure out how to unmute. Am I unmuted? You're good, you're unmuted. Okay, good enough. All right, just a few questions. Number one is how and when do you handle no-shows? If they don't show up at five o'clock, do you uh, send a wire up, hey, I don't have this person, or do you wait till six o'clock when you turn the keys and you don't have somebody there? And is there a certain minimum number of election officials that you must have at that precinct to make it go? And uh, let me finish it. One more question. Could you have a rover sit in until somebody else shows if you need that? that that's the first question. Uh, there's a, here's a couple more. Let me, let me do those first. So. Okay. Uh, it's funny that you ask about no-shows. When I talk to my counterpart in other jurisdictions, they always complain about, oh, we had such a big number of no-shows. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We have almost none here in Fairfax County. <laughs> and it turns out we just do things a little bit differently. Um, what we do, or I'm sorry, what other jurisdictions often do is they will email out to their election officers and they'll say, here's where you're supposed to show up on election day. And then that's it. Well, we like to do things a little bit differently here in Fairfax. What we do is we ask everyone to go back and confirm, yes, I am going to show up on election day. Yeah. So we first off have everyone confirm their assignment. Uh, and then this was actually a question that came up in the chat. One of the things that we'll ask you as a chief to do before election day is to reach out to your election officers. And we'll ask you to do that two times. One, about a week or two before election day to let them know, hey, here's the specific information about our polling place. Here's the, the door we'll use to go in. Here's the voting room we're in. You know, here's where you'll store your food and all that type of stuff. And then one more time, the weekend before the election, just to say, hey, just want to make sure you're still showing up. And if anyone ever says, no, I'm not, I need to cancel this, that, whatever, let us know. And we have uh, a large stable of reserve officers ready to go. So it's very rare that a precinct has fewer than the, the number of officers we want them to have. Um, in terms of minimums, the Code of Virginia sets a requirement for there to be at least three election officers in any precinct. Um, our electoral board set a policy a couple of years ago that we want to have at least five. So that's the number we have. So even if you had a tiny precinct with only five election officers and one didn't show up, you'd still have more than the, the legal minimum. Uh, but for this election, we haven't finalized our targets yet, but I think the only precinct that might only get five election officers is the one that only has about 150 registered voters. Um, it's our, our new smallest precinct, but uh, we think it'll be probably around seven to 11 election officers in most precincts, but that's not final yet. 
Super. Next question. Assistant chiefs, do you have you done a survey to see how many of them are going to be stepping up? We did a survey earlier this year. Uh, we reached out to all of our, our past assistant chiefs and about half said they were willing to do it, which matches our expectations. A lot of people are comfortable being an assistant chief uh, because they know they don't have to be the person in charge. Uh, okay. But when you ask them to step up to being a chief, it's a little bit harder. And that's one of the reasons we're doing the Zoom today. We want to make sure that you all understand that it's okay. You can definitely be a chief. So, yep. Good, thank you. Any forecast on absentee voters for the next coming upcoming election? Is that any general idea? Large uh, or small? No, just because absentee voting numbers have fluctuated a lot over the last couple of years due to COVID and, and uh, legislative changes. Two years ago, the requirement to have a reason for early voting uh, went away. So the numbers have increased. So we expect fewer people in person on election than we've had in the past. Um, I think it was in the presidential election in 2020. Uh, I want to say we had about twice as many people vote absentee before election day than show up at the polling place on election day. Uh, but in this past November, it wasn't anywhere close to that. So we think most voters will still show up at the polling place on election day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. All right. Uh, let's see. We have Therese and then Diana. Hi, I'm Therese. I was just wondering, um, can we look at the other videos from our last election? I like looking at re reviewing those videos. And I, I have the book. That was my first question. And my second question is, I have the book up right now that you, you had placed it here. Um, the absentee ballot drop box is outside of all the main area. And I was wondering if perchance we don't have enough people because there's a little person there watching the absentee ballot. Can, ballot. If we don't have enough people for some reason, can we put it inside the entrance or exit? Sure, so two very good questions. So first off, uh, in terms of past training videos and other materials, uh, my colleague, Alina, who you've seen on many of these trainings, she couldn't be with us today, uh, but she's been working really hard on getting everything updated uh, for the next election. But everything for the June and the last November election is still published online. So if you so go to our we training website- So we can go website, to our port, for, port, our port to look at- So it's even better. You don't even have to log into your election officer portal. It's a public link, training.electionofficers.com. There's no login required. It's completely public. Anyone can look at it anytime. And all those materials okay. are there. So if we have someone on here who has never uh, been a chief or assistant chief before, and you're wondering, you know, what exactly is a chief's briefing, you can go and take a look at the chief's briefing from the last election and get a sense of what that entails. But yeah, all those materials are online. Uh, we're pretty proud of everything that we've got up there. When you look at some other jurisdictions, they don't publish as much as we do, um, but we try to have that all out there, and make it public. So and very easy what is it? Training.electionofficers.com. Training. Election. Okay. Thanks. I'll give you a tip. You can actually just go to electionofficers.com and that also works. Okay, great. I, I just like reviewing all that before even the training. Definitely. And I and was wondering your... about the absentee ballots. It's outside in the little. Right. So for the Dropbox, so the law changed, uh, I think it was two years ago, to require a Dropbox for absentee ballots at every mm -hmm. polling place on election day. Right. And so we provide a Dropbox. And what we ask is to place that Dropbox at the place, ideally it's most convenient for voters. So if you can position it just outside the building, so someone driving by can you know stop quickly, drop it off. If that's not possible, then position it near the entrance to the voting room. But what is required is that an election officer must monitor that Dropbox at all times. Okay. So you have to have an election officer stationed there. So what we usually recommend is that individual should be the same one who's greeting voters. Oh. So if okay, you're able to position your greeter just outside the building, great. Um, I know in the election a year ago, I was able to go out and visit some precincts and I think it was like 90 degrees that day. It was pretty tough for people to stay outside. Um, and so we said, no problem, just move inside the building. Right, um, and it was raining that day too. See there? Yeah, that's... there's always some some kind of weather here in Virginia. Yeah, so, so okay. But they had, had mentioned about not having, I'm, I'm, this might not even happen. Happen, but if we don't have enough staff. So in the, I don't think this will happen because we're going to try and make sure we get every precinct to have enough okay. election officers. Right. And even if you have cancellations the day before the election, or if you do have a no-show on election day, we'll send you replacements. Oh, okay. But if you don't have enough for some reason, you know, maybe something's going on, I don't know. Um, uh, you could take that Dropbox <laughs> position inside the voting room 
And it could be the greeter that's inside the voting room, could be the one monitoring the Dropbox, or in an absolute worst case scenario, position that Dropbox near the check-in table and one of the check-in officers could monitor it. Uh, okay. That should be an option of last resort though. Yeah, no. all right, well, thank you. Sure. And I think lastly, we've got Diana. So Diana, what's your question? Hi, Robbie. Uh, this is Diana. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going back to, I believe it was David who had a question about, you know, exposure to lawsuits. I'm not a Virginia lawyer, but I, I was a federal prosecutor. So what I would just generally say is that there's probably a statute so long as any poll worker is working within the scope of their you know, duty, uh, there's a limited immunity from lawsuit. Now that would be under federal law, there certainly is. Uh, so I would imagine in, in the state of Virginia, there'd be a similar statute. I mean, that's very extreme. And what that would mean is that, God forbid there's a lawsuit, right? And it really was literally, you were doing something literally within your job, whatever it is to be an election officer or run the precinct, uh, that should be dismissed. Cannot, the, someone cannot sue you for that. And in fact, there's probably a Virginia state statute that would um, prevent if it was the potential voter trying to mess with the process or your duties as an officer, you know, to impede a, a state officer in this case. Um, that probably would be a problem for them, not the other way around. Anyway, that's my two cents worth. That's it. Thank you for sharing that. You're yeah, if this is an area of concern, I'm happy to check with the, uh, the Office of the County Attorney for Fairfax, and we'll try and get uh, some more information so Beth and I can follow up on that uh, and get you all, you know, a firm answer for what the status here is in, in Fairfax as well. Uh, but that's definitely helpful to, to know. So thank you, Diana. No problem. So, thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It's been fantastic having you. You've had some great questions. We hope um, the information we present at the beginning about what it entails to be a first time chief helped you understand the process and the timeline and the responsibilities. We hope the stories that some of our office staff who have been chiefs for the first time in the past and we're not always excited about doing it, uh, you know, it was much like this year where we had a need for people to step up and they did that. I hope all that information helps reassure you that yes, you can be a chief. Um, you don't have to have any special skills or abilities to be a chief. Uh, the chiefs that we sign, they're just, you know, they're just another election officer. We do ask you to do a little bit more than what we ask of regular election officers. And we wanna make sure you're aware and understand what those things are. But I think all of you are ready to, to be a chief. So if you have any further questions, feel free to call us. Our number is 703-324-4735 or send us an email at electionofficers at fairfaxcounty.gov. Those are both at the bottom of every email that we send you. And let us know what, what's preventing you from being a chief. Is there anything else that we can do to help you feel comfortable, feel ready, and feel prepared? And if not, I hope after today, you all say yes. So if you haven't already, make sure to fill out the availability form in the election officer portal uh, and check off yes, uh, I would like to be a chief. Uh, and as Abigail said, if you've already filled out that form and you said maybe or no, just send us an email and we can change it on your behalf. So with that said, uh, and on behalf of all of my wonderful colleagues here at Excuse the office. Excuse me, Ravi, I do oh. have one more thing if I can add, just as Please, a reminder to everybody. Um, let's just presume in a perfect world, all of you are just so excited and bursting with enthusiasm. You're going to step up and be chiefs. Guess what? We need to replace you as election officers in those precincts. So get out there and recruit. Um, we absolutely still are accepting applications. We particularly need representatives of the Republican Party. So if you're members of organizations, if you have a favorite barista, if your librarian is super helpful, anybody that you come across who seems to possess the qualities that you know we're looking for in great election officers who want to serve the communities, you need to send them our way. Thanks. That's a great point, Abigail. Yeah, with all of you stepping up, we definitely need other folks to, to fill in. I would love nothing more uh, than to have a uh, 50-50 party balance in every single precinct. It's something that we focused really hard on over the last five years since I first started here. And we've increased uh, the number of Republican officers we've had uh, in each general election. Uh, so if you help us identify more folks that wanna serve, we would love to get them assigned. Uh, we're doing paperwork appointments every week. So if someone applies to be an election officer right now, the website is uh, vote, the number four, fairfax.com slash apply. If they apply to be an election officer, they can immediately sign up for a paperwork appointment and get that done in the next few days. Uh, they can go and access the training, 
uh, and they can be ready to go and be assigned in the first wave of officers. So uh, thank you, Abigail. I appreciate that. And for all of you that do agree to be a chief, Abigail will be the person uh, that you'll be in touch with at times to talk about your assignment as a chief or your officers or other things like that. So this has been a great Zoom. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry some of our, our colleagues like Lena and Kay couldn't join us today for various reasons, but they'll be back with us hopefully next time. Uh, and on behalf of all of our office staff who work really hard to plan and prepare for each election, I wanna say thank you to each of you for either having served as an officer in the past or now considering uh, stepping up as a chief for this election. So again, please make sure you fill out that availability form. Say yes, you'll be a chief. And we hope to see you serving this November. Thanks a lot and have a great day, everyone.